Welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, the original plan was we were gonna have a talk where I was gonna talk about the various K through 12 strikes that have been taking place. And then of course the grad students at the UW had to mess it up and go on strike and so we had to, we couldn't have a solidarity meeting and not talk about the strike happening on our own campus. And I think it's the first one since 2001, is that correct? So it's, it's been a while. As like with, with these educator strikes, some of them have never happened before. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about that, the rest of them will. Um, the, uh, Kyle is also going to talk about the, the strikes are starting to spread, although on a smaller level at uh, various universities in Britain, um, throughout Britain, uh, throughout the United Kingdom actually, uh, as well as at Columbia, at University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Um, there was also a strike of 53,000 uh, workers in three different unions in California recently for three days. So the strike is, is, is coming back after literally decades of some of the lowest levels. So it's really exciting, and there's a lot of lessons, I think, for, for us to learn. Um, I also want to just briefly mention Puerto Rico also, because there's been an uh, ongoing struggle, just like in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, the shock doctrine of basically they want to try to charterize and turn all public schools in Puerto Rico into, into charter schools. Um, I don't have time to get into that. That could be a, a whole talk on its own. But there's ongoing strikes and you know, other countries and the U.S. colony in Puerto Rico and all throughout uh, the U.S. And it's really exciting. Um, so the four strikes that I'm going to try to generalize from without getting into a ton of detail are West Virginia, which ended uh, after nine days on March 6th, about 20,000 workers. Oklahoma, which went out for about two weeks and ended in mid-April. That was about 40,000 workers. Arizona ended on May 3rd after about six days on strike, and that involved about 60,000 workers. Um, and then there were smaller level one day strikes in places like Kentucky on April 2nd and, and, and April 13th. North Carolina also had uh, a shutdown of a lot of the schools uh, um, last uh, Wednesday, the day after their one day strike. Um, and I would argue, I think this is the most important wave of the strikes in the United States probably since the 1970s that have like one after the other have happened in such a short period of time within the span of a couple months that have been, if not winning everything, been winning really important things. Um, and drawing lessons for all of us. Um, so you might have heard the term red state revolt, right? Um, and it's because these states have had a uh, Republican, Republican trifecta, the governor, the House, and the Senate. Um, and I think it's, it's very exciting because, I, you know, a lot of us in the ISO, and I imagine other socialists as well, never fully believe that just because Trump won and the Republicans uh, you know, control that, that it means that the people of those states are necessarily dupes or conservative or idiots or what, whatever the garbage you think back to how um, Trump's election was portrayed. And I think this, I hope and I think it's starting to, to blow massive holes into that, um, that people actually are not automatons that are doing whatever Trump wants them to do, that they're living, breathing humans. And I think the red state revolt is a convenient way to summarize it, but I think it's more important to look at it as a class struggle. The, the, the politicians, and the rich against the educators who are workers. The 99% against the 1%, the haves versus the have-nots, that's, I think, what, what's really going on. In terms of the background, if people have questions, uh, let me know. There's a lot, lots of statistics I could use to back up some of the background issues, and I'm just gonna blow through some of the, the key things. The, the underlying issues really is, is one of poverty. You have these states, all these different states, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Arizona, for sure. I'm not exactly sure where Kentucky ranks on it but at least those first three are all within like 45th and 50th in terms of teacher pay uh, in the country. Um, they're faced not all exactly the same, but, but cuts to health care, cuts to pensions. Um, you probably have heard stories of educators working second and third jobs before or after school driving for Uber. You know, there was a story of someone working for Delta Airlines and loading and unloading planes before or after teaching classes all day. Um, there have been massive cuts to education uh, funding, literally talking billions of dollars in, in these different states since the recession uh, 10, 10 or so years ago. Um, the result has been really large class sizes, 35, 40 in some instances, really old buildings, really old uh, supplies, infestations of mice and cockroaches in Arizona, scorpions in their classrooms. Uh, I, you know, in terms of old books, textbooks, I saw, I forget which state it was, uh, somebody said uh, Jimmy Carter was still the president in their social studies textbook. <laughs> so you can see like really, like it's, we're, we're, we're in massive need of, of, 
updates and facilities and supplies and so on and so forth. Uh, some of the strikes have fought against privatization, vouchers, charter schools. Um, if you don't know what those are, ask questions. We'll get into it during discussion. And then I think the, the overall standardization of schools, test scores, you know, students graduating being tied to test scores, but also teachers' evaluations being tied to student test scores. Um, and, and there's a loss of power, I think, on the job that's also part of what's led to this. And then folks have probably heard these are all right-to-work states, which is really relevant, I think, for all the fear about Janus coming any, any day now, um, that all of these states that have had strikes, at least the four that, I, that I'm touching on, are all right-to-work states where basically somebody can be in the union, um, but they don't have to pay uh, dues. They get all the benefits, but they don't have to financially c contribute. And there's about 28 of them right now in the United States. And then one other reason or background to all this is that in all these states, there's either conservative union leaderships or weak union leaderships that um, and, you know, don't represent a huge chunk of the, the total members uh, or the total educators. So, for example, Oklahoma has about 12,000 or 14,000 out of 40,000 uh, educators are in the union. Arizona, it's about a third, 20,000 out of 60,000 are in the union. So there's some union structure, but it's not, it's not uh, statewide. And so it's created space, ironically, because of the weakness of the leadership for, for the rank and file, for the regular workers to basically step in and fill a void and create their own leadership structures, um, which I think is what is so exciting about this. And I won't get into it, but we're starting to see it spread to blue states or mixed states, like North Carolina, for example, has a Democratic governor. Um, the Republicans control the House and Senate. Colorado has a governor and a House controlled by the Dems and the Senate controlled by the uh, Republicans. Um, all right, in terms of some positive themes. Seven minutes left? Or? No, you're at seven minutes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, there's just too much. Wow. Okay. Man. Seven minutes. All right. In terms of positive lessons, I'll try to blow through some of this. Um, the most, uh, this is really the most, I'll focus on this and some of the negative stuff people can ask questions we can do during discussion. What is so inspiring about this is, so I talked about the weak union leaderships in these states. What's so exciting is, is that I mentioned the term rank and file, or just regular, every, every average worker. Um, they built networks, they've created them, they've been the leaders, they've pushed the union leaders either to do stuff and support them, or sometimes they've, they've gone right around them. Um, in Arizona, sort of the high point of it, there are, uh, they created a liaison or a representative network where they f they've got 2,000 people in 800 of the 1,500 schools to basically be union reps or liaisons without any sort of formal title, because a lot of them aren't even actually in, officially in the union. Um, and then they used, brilliantly I think, social media to coordinate these struggles and created like de facto, like we have a caucus, I won't go into all of it, but just, it's called Social Equity Educators within the Seattle Education Association, the union in town. Um, they created like de facto caucuses through Facebook that stored all kinds of flyers and documents. Um, the liaisons would report to the leadership team of about 10 or so people um, who would then do Facebook Live videos or posts. And then the liaisons would take it back to their workplaces, discuss it, act on things. Then they had this escalation of actions. They start off with t-shirts. Um, just everyone wear their red t-shirt on a Wednesday. Then they built it up to uh, walk-ins where they would all gather in front of school and then march in together at the same time. They did uh, pickets outside of the governor's uh, monthly radio show in, in Phoenix. They did a statewide rally of 5,000 people a few weeks before the strike. And then they had plans. They said, we will not have a strike unless we get literally, I remember when I, f I first asked one of the leaders, she said, uh, the number 1,000 got thrown out. And I said, do you mean 1,000 people to participate? And they were like, no, 1,000 schools around the state. So can you imagine? Like, we've done good stuff in Seattle. We have 100 schools in Seattle. They coordinated and got over 1,000 schools, 1,100 to be exact, and over 100,000 people participated in one day's worth of walk-ins before they were willing to say, we're going to take a strike vote. And then they coordinated with their liaisons around the state and, and, and had a strike vote and then walked out. And when they walked out, I think they had 75,000 people in downtown Phoenix, um, the first statewide strike ever there. A um, couple other brief lessons. You know, I have to say, as you know, I've been a socialist for a long time. 
and I believe in the power of the working class, but it's been really hard until lately to be able to say, here's an example that I believe, you know, I can read Marx and I can quote you the Communist Manifesto, but when tens of thousands of workers are going out on strike, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to say, that's what I'm talking about, you know? And so you, like when you talk to, talk to the folks, I mean, these are, some of them, you know, maybe you've read a little bit of this or a little bit, of, you know, social propaganda or history or whatever. But they're like they're, the people who are leading this are not like hardened Marxists. There might be a few, but most of them aren't. Some of them in West Virginia are members of Democratic Socialists of America, um, you know, but fairly new members. Like there's mostly new people who've been radicalized, um, which is beautiful. Um, and anyways, it just, it, it, I think, it's a small glimpse. I'm not trying to overblow it. It's a small glimpse for socialists of what we talk about, like that working people have the potential to actually not just strike, but they're putting forward a vision and education is really crucial to our society. I was like, these are the sorts of things we could do with our schools. And these are the sorts of things that, that the education of our children should be all about. And that can broaden out, I think, to, to many other things. It's, re it's really exciting. And our job, the reason we want to have this panel um, you know, you, you can read Socialist Work. I think we've published about 40 different articles around the country. We want to try to create a platform for the workers and the educators in all the different states here at the UW to be able to tell their story, but not in isolation, to try to draw it out and draw lessons for, for everywhere else. So we've, you know, had articles in our paper. We've done, I think this is at least the fourth or fifth different solidarity meeting around the country. Um, and it's, you know, it's an attempt to try to generalize all this. Um, last couple lessons, and I promise I'll wrap up. I just think they're important. Um, on the heels of the Me Too movement, I think it has to be said what's really exciting. If folks don't know that the role of, of women leading this, um, as you can see here for the UAW workers, but also teachers, 77% of all teachers in the U.S. are women. For elementary school, it's 90%. High school, it's, more, it's a little below two-thirds. You know, but that, that's really important in the context of the Me Too, in the context of all the sexism that exists. I would like to think it's a big middle finger to all the sexists out there who try to uh, uh, put down women for, for whatever bullshit, bullshit reasons. Um, and I think it's really important. People, if, if you ever hear sexist garbage, you should point to Me Too and these strikes as counterexamples of, 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 of uh, the role that women are playing currently in leading, like literally, the most important strike wave in, in the United States for several decades. Um, and then the last, last main point is just the issue of solidarity. The idea of an injury to one is, is an injury to all. There's been solidarity if folks know and have paid attention to the different strikes, but to, they've tried to divide like um, in different strikes um, the teachers from all the other support professionals who are in the union by giving like a certain amount of wage or even no wages to the support staff and teachers have fought against that. So I think that's really crucial. Um, there's also been solidarity between um, the, uh, the general population, obviously, which I think is the most, the most exciting thing um, is, you know, we set up a pizza fund for the UAW folks and in three days we raised $3,000. Like that wasn't the ISO, that was like 200 really small contributions all, all leading up to being able to, to help feed them on the day of the strike. And that sort of stuff happened. We delivered 600 pizzas in Arizona, several hundred in Oklahoma. I don't know how many they did in West Virginia. Um, that's the kind of solidarity that I, that I think is, is crucial. Um, and the struggle is going to continue. I will go ahead and, and in there, um, if there's questions after they've all spoken, we can get into there's various um, not negative in a bad sense, but just negative, like things to learn that maybe they wish they, they, they could have done better in some of these strikes that we could get into. Um, but uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming, and I look forward to hearing what they have to say and to the discussion. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, my name's Kyle Tremblay. I'm a um, research assistant in the anthropology department. Um, I'm also a member of the ISO and a member of the UAW, um, Local 4121. Um, so I'm gonna talk more broadly about, um, so Darren touched on K through 12 and the strikes happening there. I'm gonna talk about the surging strikes that are happening throughout higher education right now. And of course, not all of them in, um, I'm not gonna be able to do justice to like all the powerful things happening there, but just 
going to touch on some of the main points that I see and connecting it to our own struggle, which uh, Mandy and Molly will talk about afterwards. Um, so basically, at, I mean, these things are surging across the US and as uh, Darren pointed out in the UK, I am not gonna touch on the ones happening in the UK, but um, that would be good to look into. Um, but at the City University of New York, um, CUNY, um, on May 6th, they, um, the Student Senate passed a resolution to, di to divest their um, university from companies that support Israeli apartheid. And um, this was like a largely student-led movement that was um, organized by the Palestinian Solidarity Alliance, um, the Young Democratic Socialists, Arab Studies, the ISO, and uh, the, union, the Graduate Student Union at CUNY. Um, and then at Loyola University in Chicago, there's been a non-tenured faculty. Um, they held a one-day strike last month. Um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, or the other UW, um, the Teaching Assistance Association, or the TAA, um, they organized a work in to just draw attention to the invisible labor that they do um, at the university. Um, and like UW here, they are, were arguing against, um, they were demanding to remove student fees so they have to pay like $1,200 per year just to be um, workers who ha make poverty level wages, um, similar to the same way we do here. Um, it's interesting to note that their um, union is just teaching assistants, and so I think that's something special about our own is that you know we are compromised of you know teaching assistant, research assistants like myself, creators, tutors, um, and across undergraduate and graduate um, boundaries, um, which. My comrades can talk about soon. Um, and then at Columbia, it's been really exciting. There, um, they are also the UAW um, local to um, 2110, um, and they led a week-long strike. Um, there are 1,200 students, um, which is kind of crazy. Thing about you know we're like 4,500 here in, in the lar larger uh, UW um, system. But um, they were focused on building solidarity with other struggles. So throughout the year, they were shutting down, like several white supremacist speakers came to campus and their union mobilized to shut those speakers down. They were working with um, the anti-sexual violence group, No Red Tape, um, to demand like 24 seven access to um, rape crisis centers, mental health services, um, and healthcare. Um, they also just like held teach-ins every week around different political issues pertaining to white supremacy, um, sexual harassment on campus, neoliberalism, um, and among other things. Um, but that, it's, I mean, it's kind of upsetting and, you know, like I, I don't want to be too negative here, but I'm pointing out like the larger trends throughout these um, in higher education, but it kind of dissipated because their school year ended um, and so they didn't come to a compromise really and things have dissipated once students leave campus for the summer. Um, the new school um, graduate, they just, their graduate student, graduate student union was just formed. Um, and there it was really exciting too because basically, um, I mean, it's interesting because the new school like represents itself as this like socially progressive campus, but um, they organized in solidarity with um, cafeteria workers there. Basically the university said they were gonna fire cafeteria workers who are um, primarily black and like hire low-wage student labor instead but um, the union joined with the cafeteria workers um, and mobilized against that and they were successful um, which is really exciting. Um, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign they are 2,700 members of AFT Local 6300. Um, they went on strike for two weeks after six months six months of not even being on a contract um, and they were bargaining for like 17 months or something absurd with no movement whatsoever. Um, they, you know, just organized sit-ins and sleep-ins. I think like 12 students occupied the um, provost's office and refused to leave and like students were bringing them food and water and various supplies. Um, I was talking with uh, one of my friends who go there and um, he was just telling me how important it was to like focus on those movements, but also like getting wider support from the community and like um, faculty, because like so much of universities rely on their representations. And so like getting visibility about the fucked up policies that they're um, doing like is essential in, in this. Um, and then as Darren touched on at the UC system, the University of California system, um, the AFSCME local 329, 
um, they're like 50,000 plus folks um, and mobilized with other unions as well, but across like 10 college campuses. Um, the workers there are custodians, um, service workers, and cooks um, across the campuses, um, primarily black and Latinx and all poorly paid. Um, but they were demanding equal pay across racial and gender lines, um, as well as like increased protections for sexual harassment. Um, but they were joined by 30,000 members of the California Nurses Association, um, hotel and restaurant workers from Unite Here Local 2, postdoc workers from UAW Local 5810, and then students, faculty, and members of <coughs> local socialist groups as well. Um, they struck for three days um, and were unsuccessful in the end, but um, either way, like, I think it's important to point out that these like strengthened collective struggles regardless and like confidence and I was reading something about um, that was written by Columbia students and even though they went on that week-long strike they were saying that they wished they had throughout the year just participated in small rallies or small struggles just like small mobilizations to keep momentum going and keep um, people confident in themselves and like their collective power and I think these are all essential things so like I'm going to touch on some of the main takeaways but um, I think it's interesting looking at like all of these struggles that it's important to note that these aren't just labor labor struggles that workers are black Latinx um, LGBT plus indigenous etc and all of our all of these labor struggles are bound up with larger struggles um, for social justice um, even anti-imperialism like here um, super and other groups for Palestinian rights came up and talked during our rally, um, I think it's important to express solidarity with a wider array of intersectional struggles and how they are all bound up with labor. I think a lot of times people try to separate that, especially um, universities themselves attempt to do so, um, like they were doing with uh, trans uh, healthcare here. Um, but then it's also important to point out like these are not isolated. Um, occurrences like clearly these are all surging across the US because there's a huge dissatisfaction and um, incapability to live through draconian neoliberal policies that are c extremely just like they're privatizing universities and taking away safety nets for students while pushing us to work harder for less money um, and so it's important to recognize that we are in a much wider array of these struggles and that we stand in solidarity with all of them um, but then looking to just like you know they're going to keep going like that like looking back at um, earlier this year when um, the GOP tried to ta tax graduate students as well mm -hmm. um, for our tuition waivers um, but these are all attempts to exclude working class and poor people from even getting into higher education and so it's important to stand up to these neoliberal policies um, and then for like many students like myself um, you know this was the first time like I remember like at, we had a pre-strike meeting and um, one of the UAW organizers asked like oh who's been in a strike before and I think only like three people raised their hands like the vast majority of us have never been in a strike before so it's important to note that even you know across the universities like a lot of times these are folks first experiences of collective struggle and they are extremely fulfilling they make a ton of confidence um, and it's important to keep that momentum going but then also continue to inspire other movements across the nation reach out to folks learn from each other um, build solidarity like we're trying to do here um, and then just in regards to union busting across these cases um, it, there, I noticed like several trends basically a lot of times universities <coughs> are attempting to claim that like us as grad students are greedy by asking for more money um, by saying that like oh your tuition is waived um, therefore like that counts too um, whereas like a lot of students especially those like myself who are from working class and poor backgrounds we're already in like six-figure debt of loans just to have gotten to higher education and then get paid poverty level wages which is really fucked up especially when like administrators themselves are making absorbent amounts of money um, so like just we have to like <laughs> shoot that claim down really quick 
Um, but then also I saw a lot of the universities are pointing to Trump's policies. Um, the people that he put on the National Labor Relations Board, but also the Janus case, just to like limit collective bargaining and union yeah, power. Mm -hmm. um, but then like the biggest thing that I'm noticing too, like especially as is clear in the UW, clay, UW case that uh, Molly and Mandy will touch on, but like just stalling in all of these cases. And I think this is something especially with higher education because there's breaks. And so like basically all of them wait for the contract to end and then wait for summer when a lot of students leave campus and there's not as much ability to um, mobilize mass amounts of people together in strikes and other rallies and things like that. Um, so we have to continue mobilizing because, I mean, looking at this case, they're going to stall until summer. And so like the question is like, a lot of times this is going to carry up into the next school year. And so how do you keep that momentum going? How do you keep building solidarity and keep things going through that? Um, I think this is a, a question that like all of the struggles show is happening and it's very necessary to like think of ways through that. Um, either way, I think that they, you know, they are all failing to realize that these are labor struggles are part of a subterranean fire and in the end they can't be put out. Thank you. I don't need a mic. I just, I, I really project. <laughs> I'm a teacher. Really so oh. What do I do? Just, what just do I do? put it on there for it okay. um, So, does that work? Uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure yet where you all are at in terms of what you know about bargaining. So I'll just give a very brief sort of synopsis, synopsis of where, where we're at. So I personally and we as a bargaining team and membership have spent hundreds of hours over the last four months bargaining with UW administration in good faith on our part. We presented compelling data, extensive research, personal testimonial that all all prove one thing, that our membership is dealing with economic precarity that is untenable and unsustainable and is having negative impacts on the quality of instruction, the quality of research, the quality of graduate students, uh, the quality of teaching for undergraduate students. Um, and that, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately to date administration has been unmoved. Our other demands that they were pushing back on were um, mental health care, which should be fully covered, but through a loophole because of an internal policy in Hall Health where there are only seven therapists. Um, we, everyone for long-term mental health therapy has to go to someone in network, which means they pay um, a deductible and a co-pay. We'd, and then tr in fully inclusive trans health care as well. We'd reached tentative agreements with them, which we thought we would get resolved today on those issues, but they presented it to us as a package proposal with the outrageous 222 three-year contract wage increases, which don't even keep up with inflation, let alone lift our people out of the poverty line, um, as well as the status quo on fees with a caveat that they can actually raise them every quarter at their discretion and then bargain the impacts after with us in three years. Um, so um, on the 15th, I mean, I don't know how many of you were out there. It was an amazingly successful strike. And I think uh, building solidarity and coalition building is, is one of our most important power plays here and one of the most important things we can do um, to uh, contribute and re-energize this labor spring that we've been, that we've been witnessing. Um, so, I mean, uh, for instance, so we were sanctioned by many, uh, many other unions, um, which, which was amazing. Coke trucks turned around, Teamsters turned around, uh, 60 trade workers walked off the job. Um, we had a... <laughs> We had representatives from IWW, from uh, CEIU. Um, so just many, many unions uh, have, have sort of joined with us because they recognize that if they're coming for you, they're coming for 
us next. Mm -hmm. And that is how we need to contextualize this. Um, so I think that that's, it was really powerful. Um, in fact, the construction um, workers union uh, do, actually didn't, their leadership did not sanction our strike, mm -hmm. but uh, the workers at the sites, we were there at the picket line, and the workers did a wildcat strike and walked off the job, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Yeah, when you have rank and file members mm -hmm. uh, respecting your picket line, even though it was not sanctioned, it's a really powerful mm -hmm. and, and like meaningful mm -hmm. gesture. And it, that's a very important, we, sh we shut down construction at UW for two weeks, I tell you what. Um, so right now, just in terms of, um, in terms of next moves, we are currently prepping for a strike from June 2nd to June 15th. Longer term strike at the end. And so we're doing everything. So we have two more negotiations scheduled before that date. Um, <laughs> in order to demonstrate to our membership that we are doing everything we can to avoid a strike. And in the off chance that UW admin decides to be even anywhere close to reasonable or smart strategically. But so we will be, we will be bargaining two more times, um, but we are planning and going forward with a longer end of the year strike. And because in higher education, summer, et cetera, well, we, what we would do after June 15th when all uh, grading is done would basically be withholding final exams, withholding grades. And what we would do is we'd call it off, and this is what we did in 2001, when, last time we went on strike, um, let people take their summer appointments if they have them, um, and then come back in the fall, s threaten to strike again. We have the infrastructure in place, we have the power in place, and that actually is also what they did in 2001, and, and they didn't win after the first strike. You don't always win immediately in a strike. A strike is important um, for other reasons as well. So that, that's, our, that's our current um, plan. Um, I think I had a couple of things I wanted to say. Mm. So I think also, so we need a tap, this was briefly mentioned by Kyle, but our two sources of power, um, higher ed strikes don't really work like factory strikes where um, every day that they're not producing, right, a, a car, they're losing money. The university is much more insulated from our, with us withholding our labor because tuition is already paid. Um, so our main sources of, of power are disrupting having faculty support, having faculty refuse to come in and do the grading, do the work, having PIs and, and like research people call UW admin and say, hey, I need my RAs to do my data on my, my grant, um, and then students. So we need to be strong on our messaging to undergrads because undergrads, what they will try to do and what they've tried to do this whole time is pit we love what we do, we love our work, our research, and we love our teaching. And they use those against us, and they try to split us from our two main allies. And so if, I think you said you were an undergraduate, so just getting the word out to undergraduates, and I have a shit ton of teaching materials that I can share of from this, um, is, is, is essential. Um, and and they're, they are the ones who also can call and threaten to, you know, withdraw and our other source of power. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, and I also think it's important, um, we need to hold UW accountable to its alleged ideals of equity, uh, economically, racially, socially, um, which currently they purport to value as a marketing strategy, but um, don't put any resources uh, behind. Um, so we need to expose the duplicitousness of their rhetoric and their actions. Um, we are trying to help them solve a problem uh, and make them have integrity as an institution <laughs> and, in what, and in what they advertise themselves as. I mean, that's, yeah. 
Um, throughout bargaining, what, am I out of time? You're, um, you're eight and a half minutes. So yeah, yeah. Um, throughout bargaining, um, we have seen them employ um, what I would call bad faith bargaining, but I'm using it loosely. Um, essentially, it's a union busting technique. Uh, in union literature, it's called creating futility, where they don't move and they don't negotiate and they just run us around and see if they can tire us out and wait us out because they have the resources to do so and they don't know or think or aren't sure what our real striking power is. We did it one day, so they're nervous. But we need to make them more nervous because today it was, the, it was the same tactic of no movement. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's it. And oh, I just, I also just wanted to flag that like this strike is about, uh, as Darren and Kyle also said, um, our strike is about taking back public education and, and returning the university as well as K through 12 um, into what it should have always been. Now it is a corporate model. Um, and it used to be, it should be, it, it ostensibly is a public service. And that it is in everyone's interest as a society to have a well-educated populace. People thought it was crazy to, to make public high schools until they were like, wait, this is a democracy and everybody votes. Everybody should be highly educated. Um, so, so we really need uh, UW to, to realign their misaligned priorities in, in their spending and to value uh, their people. Also, in case you didn't know, our postdocs finally, through many y uh, years and direct action, uh, got their vote to unionize and uh, will be joining UAW 4121. So, so. Uh, that will give, that also scares the university. So a lot of the, the bargaining going on with us is uh, setting precedent. All the other unions on campus negotiate after us. Mm -hmm. So they are trying to protect themselves. Um, but the postdocs will be great allies. And um, if we end up doing a one-year contract or not doing a contract, uh, we'll bargain again with the postdocs. Um, in the spring, which would be very pow powerful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So I'm Molly. I'm a steward um, in the union, uh, the UW 421 chapter. Um, and I'm also a, oh, sorry. I forgot about this thing. Oh my God. This is like a really difficult clip. Is that working? Okay, cool. Um, so I am not going to spend too much time on like bargaining or where we're at now. I'm instead kind of going to talk about some of the ways in which UW um, has been trying to shape the narrative around our strike and has been attempting to do some of the work Mandy's talked about, pitting us against our students, pitting us against our faculty. Um, first, I wanted to just kind of briefly respond to some of the things that everybody said. So I completely agree with your point, Darren, about this being um, a really interesting moment in terms of, although I have my my <laughs> grief with me too, with um, sort of solidarity movements and union movements happening in feminized labor forces. Um, and I think uh, to jump on what Kyle said, I think this is especially important in a lot of like domestic labor forces that are predominantly positions uh, that are really, really poorly compensated, um, that are mostly occupied by women and women of color. Um, so I think uh, we're seeing this like the laundry workers at UW, right? Uh, predominantly older women of color um, who have very few options and almost no one to advocate for them. Like the importance of organizations like ISO and Socialist Alternative to create these connections between different unions is more essential now than ever. Um, so yeah, um, I also think uh, the, what Mandy said about the way that our strike works, um, the way in which we can't just withhold labor like strikes used to do. We step out of the factory for an hour and everyone freaks out because the company just lost millions. I mean, this is true, I think, of a lot of white collar labor forces and other labor forces. So we're at this moment in which we need to sort of 
relearn how to do this kind of grassroots organizing and striking. Um, and it's something that's been really actively um, de-incentivized for a lot of us for 30, 40 years. <laughs> so doing so um, and having organizations like this to help people figure out how to do that, how to balance labor fairly uh, when everyone's working 60 to 80 hours a week on. It's all volunteer labor because there aren't strong union positions getting paid for <laughs> uh, right now is, I think, yeah, absolutely actually, essential. Yeah. The university violated um, <laughs> contract language, which ensures that five of the mm -hmm. 17 to 19 bargaining committee members, mm -hmm. five, get a course release, meaning that their 20 hours, please, 20 hours, mm -hmm. could be spent instead of doing that on bargaining because yeah. it's a huge job. Mm -hmm. They flat out have denied our course yeah. releases as a, a deliberate attempt to mm -hmm. cripple bargaining committee's capacity um, mm -hmm. because we come as volunteers and they come mm -hmm. as paid huge yeah. amounts as their real job, mm -hmm. well, our real job and work is, is elsewhere. Yeah. And I know this is, I'm sure, really true in K through 12 education too, because every teacher I've ever known works 60 to 80 hours a week <laughs> uh, and could work more <laughs> and often do. Um, so I think that's really essential in drawing these alliances between unions um, and laying those foundations so that we don't need to spend a massive amount of time and effort getting people aware that we could just call on those people at every contract negotiation and at every dispute um, is, I think, completely essential. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to sort of touch on uh, a little bit of um, sort of personally why I'm really invested in this strike. Um, I'm going to mirror a lot of what the two of you said, right? Like I'm 50%, I pay 50% of my rent on housing, um, so I'm, I fall in the severely rent burden category, and that's before our fees that we're paying currently. Um, but I really, I don't really look at my participation in the strike as something that's about me or about compensation because I don't think that our strike is for me. I think that I managed to get this far because I have um, security nets that not everyone has and that those are the people that we need here to keep the university equitable and to make it possible for it to improve and live up to what it claims. Um, and I think that a lot of those people aren't even here right now to do this because they were prohibited from choosing this line. And when we're thinking about who's prohibited from a graduate education, we're also talking about who's going to be teaching future generations, who's going to be um, doing the research that dictates what's considered uh, public knowledge for the next who knows how long, right? So this isn't just a question of who can you know, go have fun with a liberal arts degree. It's like who can dictate the narrative of our culture and our society. Um, so I'll get back to my point now. Um, I study uh, neoliberal governance. I am especially interested in social media and shifts towards um, neoliberal self-modification and the ways in which political activity is possible in an era in which that's sort of dominant and um, in which grassroots organizations are sort of permanently under fire and under attack. Um, how can we use these resources to change things? And this is what I teach on as well, so I think it's really pivotal to practice that in life, and so many of us do work like this. Um, but uh, in terms of what we've been doing um, to, to moderate and work with press, um, we've, had, we've had a few victories, I think. We've had really positive coverage from the undergraduate student newspaper. They've been fantastic. Uh, they wrote, a, I don't know if everybody has seen it, they wrote an editorial, the entire editorial staff wrote a, a sort of op-ed that had some of the best fact-checking of any <laughs> press we've received um, and endorsed our strike. Uh, I've heard really positive um, feedback from my undergraduate students. Um, in the English department, we teach our own sections of 23 students, um, and it's a core class, so every student at the UW goes through this class um, in some iteration. But some of the news coverage we've received, for example, on the day of our strike, uh, Cairo, Kiro? Whatever. whatever. Cairo Not worth knowing. Um, they did a Cairo story, seven. Cairo 7, they did a story about us um, in which they interviewed us. They spent an hour and a half watching all of our speakers who had really fantastic material prepared. And then their first question to the two people they interviewed, myself included, was, so why are you going on strike? <laughs> um, and then the actual, art the actual um, you know, news coverage they ran was about two minutes long and ended and concluded with a number of statistics presented on the screen. Data with no context. Data with no context. They're completely misrepresented our entire movement, it was, right? It was UW's narrative. Yeah, UW's narrative. So for example, they include a statistic saying that you, 
you know, university ASEs have received a 50% pay increase in the last five years without saying that most of us still only make $22,000 a year right. <laughs> uh, or less so 50 for nine months. 50% is indicative of how horribly people yeah. are being paid yeah. before, yeah. not how generous the yeah. job is. And something that was only accomplished through union, union. bargaining. <laughs> yeah. they, at no point ever have they said, you know, we think you guys deserve to be paid more. Uh, we really value you. This is never, ever going to happen. And it's, you know, it's, it's like Mandy said, so much about telling them that we are seeing them not being what they claim to be and holding them accountable for that publicly, which is why controlling the narrative is so incredibly important in this case and I think in other union strikes um, because what else, you know, <laughs> it's very, and it's very hard to do that when massive institutions like Kiro, like the Seattle Times who wrote an equally <laughs> painful and atrocious article about our strike, um, the ways in which they spin things and claim it's fair and balanced, right? <laughs> uh, even though I'm sure all of us know there is no such thing as fair and balanced news. Um, so uh, we have, I think, received actually really positive um, press coverage to uh, The Stranger did a pretty solid piece. The UW undergraduates did multiple very solid pieces. We also received uh, an endorsement from the Full City Council in Seattle, um, sponsored by Shama Sawant yesterday. Unanimous. We unanimous vote to support our demands and to call on the UW to swiftly bring an end to bargaining and give us a fair contract, essentially meeting those demands. Meet our demands. Yeah. yeah. Um, so unanimous was kind of unexpected, but even with that pressure, they chose, even with a strike, even with undergraduate newspapers reporting a support, even with the City Council of Seattle calling on them to do this, they still refuse to move, which is just, it's... As well as the yeah. Labor Council. And yeah, as well as all of these allies we have, which I think just completely underlines and evidences, right, that this isn't a fight about our demands which they could easily meet. They are not that far away from our demands at this point, right? Our uh, in terms of their budget. Um, it's about setting a precedent to attempt to prevent any future union activity from succeeding. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why we need these alignments, we need these allies, we need organizations like ISO and like mm -hmm. Socialist Alternative mm -hmm. to create these connections. Um, even though it, doing that is gonna require an absolutely absurd amount of unpaid, unfair <laughs> labor on yep. individuals part you know we need like people working uh, in engineering at Amazon to advocate for warehouse workers and distribution center workers because it, it you know it's 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 not going to become fair unless we create alliances where they might not necessarily seem automatic and I think teachers K through 12 teachers and university teachers and UW workers are automatic yep. um, so yeah I think that's that's pretty much all I wanted to say <laughs> I, I wanted to just go through some of the weaknesses that I didn't get to do in the talk from, from the K through 12 struggles because, um, you know, we want to both like the overarching theme of all this is like you can strike and you can win and the working class is in motion. But there's also a lot of things that I think we need to learn from in order to be even more successful because none of the strikes won everything. In West Virginia, they're still fighting for health care. Kentucky didn't really, they didn't stop the attack on their pensions. Um, Oklahoma did win $6,000 in raises, um, but there's still, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in, 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 in lack of education funding. Arizona did win $400 million, but they're still lacking about $700 million in funding. Um, so just, just to go through a, a few of them real quick, I think the, the key for us is that the, the organization of, of the workers, independent of the union leadership, the, we use the term rank and file, I think that's really key. Arizona had you know, the biggest, most organized network, um, and I think uh, whatever shortcomings in, ended up happening is because the network of, of activists all around these states, you know, so some of them they built them up in like two months. So it's not like it's understandable why they weren't able to organize, you know, weeks long ongoing strikes and just smash the state, you know, not literally, but, you know, like, and win everything they want, you know, uh, longer term goal. Uh, you know, I mentioned the weak union leadership. I, uh, I think the lack of a strike fund is this enormous issue. Um, I didn't put it in any of the articles, but I was doing some research on the National Education Association. They spent like, I don't know, $150 million on lobbying and grants to nonprofits and so you know stuff like that they spent seventeen thousand dollars on strike funds last year um you know priorities right 
which, which one is actually winning hundreds of millions in funding and which one is, is it the strikes or the lobbying? It's clearly the strikes. Um, I think it's really imperative that there's democratic structure set up. Both the Arizona and Oklahoma strike didn't have democratic votes to settle it, and I think that's problematic and something to learn from. I think pushing for non-regressive funding sources is really key. In Arizona, I won't go through all of them, but like they have a $24 car tab fee that's going to ding every single person whether you got a you know rolls royce or or or, or 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 an old you know crappy car which is just not fair um they added a uh they pushed 16 million dollars of taxes on the local property owners to money that the state previously had paid because they still have i mean we still have in seattle too segregated schools um so instead of the state paying for it now local tax homeowners are gonna have to pay it um i do think it, Despite what I said about the role of women leading, I think one of the weaknesses of these strikes, not just around sexism, homophobia, but also racism, is I, you know, if you look at all of them, I don't believe there were key demands. Like when we had our Black Lives Matter at work, uh, or yeah, Black, Black Lives Matter at school week here in Seattle, you know, we, we had demands that were clear of like more black, well, I'll show you my, my t-shirt, more black educators, um, full funding of schools, ethnic studies, you know, so on and so forth. Like there were no clear demands uh, uh, like that. You know, childcare for female educators, uh, better protections against sexual, harass sexual harassment, um, better paid family leave, you know. There were no explicit demands like that. I think it's something our side needs to learn from in the future. Um, I think a lot of the struggles demobilize Oklahoma in particular to focus on elections in the fall, going back to which wins, getting Democrats elected or struggle. Um, and this isn't just a red, red state issue. There was a great article in Socialist Worker about California, the bluest of all blue states. They spend 75,000 per year uh, per person to incarcerate and about 10,000 per student. So think about the priorities right there. It's, it's absurd. Um, and I think the last sort of thing that our side has to learn from is uh, like in all these struggles, I've, I've talked to folks in Oklahoma, um, I've talked to folks in Arizona, you know, they're the, the goal of like trying to rebuild ca the caucuses, like they have these Facebook pages, but like how do we turn that into actual real organization that's not just on Facebook, all around the state? It's not, you know, it's not at the top of the priority list. And I think even if it isn't now, it's something that has to be. We have to figure out how do we turn it into to organization. Um, all right, I think I've gone through all the beautiful lessons. I'm just going to end it with uh, a quote from an Arizona striker that um, he told me over the phone after their strike because I think it really summarizes the, the, what the strike meant for them and what I think striking in general uh, can do if, if it's successful. His name is Dylan Wagella. He's 25 years old, second year of teaching. Again, he considers himself a democratic socialist, but he's not like a party member of, of DSA or anything brand new to all this stuff. Um, he said, he, he, he's one of their leaders though down there. He said, people now believe in their ability to ask for things. At my own site, teachers are talking about forming a committee to stand up and stand together against certain policies that a lot of people at my school disagree with. I think we really prove wrong the belief that you can't mobilize and be effective. It doesn't matter what the laws of the state are. If there's a cause that is just and people are motivated, you can accomplish a lot. It will change the power structure of what teachers believe they deserve and don't deserve. That's the huge lesson to be learned from our struggle. Um, and I think that does a really good job of summarizing what a successful strike and what all these strikes are changing the mindset for literally millions of people around the country. Um, well, yeah, I just want to say thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, but, yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming out, and thanks. And uh, <laughs> thanks to uh, Mandy and Molly for just, like, all the work that you all do organizing. It is an absurd amount of labor, um, and, you know, like, stepping away from your research, your teaching and shit for that long. It's messed up that that's even necessary to do. Um, so thank you all for that, and thanks, everyone, for standing in solidarity with us. Um, but yeah, I guess just like touching on some broader themes as I did before, um, I mean, talking about neoliberalism and grad school itself, I guess all, most, like, 
places of um, work are extremely alienating and like neoliberalism pushes this narrative of individuality where all individuals separated from each other, right? And I think one of the most important and beautiful things about the strike is especially in grad school, like, you know, my cohort is only four people. I don't really talk with many other grad students. Um, and just like seeing that many folks come together, even though we are doing different jobs in different departments, it's like we are facing similar struggles and it's beautiful to see that we are connected in so many ways, especially when looking at struggles happening across the nation, across the world, um, and seeing that we are connected to each other in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that's important. Um, even like my roommate, uh, Mandy's best friend, he, he's an extreme nihilist and misanthrope. He, um, <laughs> Turns out for me. Yeah. Turns out for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> Like after the day of the strike, he, I've mentioned this before, but he like said to me, he's like, wow, like I felt something there. Like that many people <laughs> coming together and mobilizing. And like to hear that from him was like really special and a lot, you know, and it shows like how <laughs> things are moving. Um, but uh, yeah, like going back to like what Mark was saying, I think it's extremely important. Like we are fighting for reforms right now. And um, these are necessary for the protection of workers and workers' livelihoods. Um, especially for folks from marginalized, criminalized, racialized backgrounds. Um, and this won't be the end. Like, no matter what, even if we won those reforms, neoliberalism will constantly come back to try to take those away from us, like with the Janus case now, um, and so many other things that are happening. And so this will continue to happen until we dismantle the white supremacist, heteropatriarchal, neoliberal capitalist order. And I really do think that that will only happen through the mobilization of workers, through grassroots mobilization and not by voting people into power. And so like these strikes show us that like we as workers um, from a variety of backgrounds, we have the power and we can do this together. Um, so I'll just sort of parrot um, things I've already said. As I said, we're planning for a strike from June 2nd to June 15th. Um, and uh, in, ten in terms of uh, like the comment about my friend who is super apolitical, anti-political, um, that, that having collective actions actually has uh, a bit of a, like a psychological um, I love cults, so I'm not using it in a bad way, but cult phenomenon where you get a group high from feeling that people support you and that you're not alone as, you know, you know, the American disease of loneliness and individualism and pull yourself up. And so I think it is really powerful in building relationships in building what we need to do a more radical restructuring mm -hmm. in the future. So all of this is, l we are laying groundwork for building massive coalition mm -hmm. workers movements. Um, and I also want to uh, emphasize that, uh, so, <coughs> Neoliberalism is a very common word used with many academics and people in socialist organizations and <laughs> other such left-wing um, groups. Uh, certainly, we all read theory and some departments do. However, I think in general messaging, um, that needs to be explained. Mm -hmm. That we need to be full, we, uh, that we can't just be, one of the things that I think is a challenge is having to communicate something that you are perhaps an expert in mm -hmm. to someone who is not mm -hmm. r familiar with that logic or way of thinking mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in a way that isn't patronizing. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of, quite frankly, <laughs> English is really radical. They have trouble doing that. They have trouble, they, <laughs> they don't want to engage with you know, the, the base, right? Um, mm -hmm. They wanna be sort of vanguards, but we need to bring the base with us because our power comes from numbers mm -hmm. and bodies. Mm -hmm. 
and massive democratic support. So I think another thing to think is that we need to be changing the way we frame this according to our audience and not in a manipulative way but in a way that is comprehensible mm -hmm. and understandable mm -hmm. and doesn't assume like in-depth in knowledge of neoliberalism mm -hmm. i think that was i think that was it Again. Oh my God, once again. I'm just going to hold it. Okay, so um, I'm just going to kind of piggyback on a lot of the points I hear, heard here, which I think were really great. Um, I think that so much of what these labor movements are about is relearning how to make infrastructure and how to think, once again, to use the word of the hour, <laughs> how, to, um, how to rethink the way that we do politics in a way um, that actually gains political power because we've seen time and again, right, that our political representatives are not representing any of our interests really from any party. Um, and I think this has a lot to do with the way that we imagine ourselves as being political, right? It has to do with the fact that we think voting and voting with our dollar, so choosing not to buy a certain product to send a message is the way to be political, and it's not. And <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work, obviously, because then we just go buy something else or we forget two weeks later why we were doing it. You know, we hop from Uber to Lyft. Um, these kinds of practices can't be it. They can't be the end, and I think labor movements like ours where there's a united common goal are the sort of first battleground for making this happen. And that I, I think that um, there's a lot to be said um, about the fact that it shouldn't just be about our work, right? Our work shouldn't be the only thing that gives us the right to certain, um, you know, like <laughs> essential things to human life, right? So this, but I think this conversation precedes those, or, or these kinds of movements precede those that will have to happen in order to secure universal basic income and to secure um, equity for people who aren't working, who can't work, who are prohibited from working, who are obstructed from having a place in these conversations. So labor movements, those who have some kind of power to say no and to lay down infrastructure um, are the, the ones that are gonna need to do things first. Um, and then we can make these fights that need to happen on a, a political level as well. Um, in a larger scale. Same thing I think should be said for local politics. I think these kinds of movements cause a massive reinvigoration in local politics and that's absolutely essential. I've, I, I remember growing up in Ohio, I don't think I had a single friend who voted in any local election ever. And I'm sure this is true for a lot of people, right? Presidential elections and that's it. And obviously that is not something that can keep happening if we want any say in our government. Um, and then I also just want to second what Mandy said. I think this is like so incredibly important. We all need to be educators and representatives all the time for this. I mean, yes, of course, people, emo uh, emotional labor is a real thing and it's unfair usually, um, but we need to be prepared to deal with ignorance and to face it um, in a way that doesn't do the same thing. Like vote, you know, vote against all of your friends who voted for Trump and defriend them on Facebook. Like. Yeah. This isn't going to be a learning opportunity. It's going to cause, I mean, there's so many conversations about how divisive our society is now because of social media. Um, and it's always been divisive, so whatever. But um, it's also like those kinds of conversations, the framing of argument, and we're biased because we teach argument, but um, <laughs> arguments need to be reconciliatory. They need to not be about winning or losing. And I think everyone in this room knows that. But um, I think that that's such an important thing about the outreach that organizations like this are doing. Um, I yeah. also want to point out that, yeah, of course, we want to win from a right, <laughs> but in higher ed, that's just not, it, they don't capitulate when you strike. They capitulate at your next credible threat of a strike. Mm -hmm. So I, I find it mm -hmm. unlikely. That doesn't mean we can't have a damn fine strike. <laughs> um, but it means I think that UW yeah. will try to weather it mm -hmm. and make us whip out again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But every level we do this, it gets, uh, in some ways, easier mm -hmm. because we get more people yeah. mobilized. We have infrastructure. And we have yeah, up-to-date infrastructure. Which is so hard <laughs> to get and hard to do, but essential.